So a very warm welcome to the latest Arabian Business Talks. My name is Eddie Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by John Oranger, the founder of Shutterstock and now co-founder of Pareto Holdings, a new venture that funds, incubates, and launches tech projects and companies from its headquarters in Miami, Florida. It's a bold and exciting evolution for the 47-year-old New Yorker, who was described as the city's first tech billionaire when Shutterstock subscription photo agency he founded with 3,000 of his own images floated on the stock exchange in 2012. He's hoping his experience in e-commerce, data, content, and technology such as AI can help unearth the next billion dollar company. And he's on the lookout for the best ideas from around the globe. So welcome, John. Thanks for joining us so early in the morning from Miami. Thanks for having me. Uh, Firstly, just um, take us back to the decision to go from easing back from the day to day of running this massively successful Shutterstock into looking at the startup scene in, in Florida. Yeah, so I was running Shutterstock for, I've been running Shutterstock for about 18 years. I started in 2003, the business. It was my 11th company. I had several failures before it. So I'd iterated from the kind of incubation stage of a business several times. Um, I didn't expect to run it for 18 years. I, uh, uh, it, it, became, uh, it became fun though to learn at each stage how to get to the next stage. So, um, you know, I remember getting to 100 employees, a couple hundred employees um, and the different kind of complexity levels. Um, eventually I took the company public. It was about probably four or 500 employees at that time. It grew to about a thousand employees um, while I was CEO. Um, and I started to get that itch to go back to the uh, early stage of a business again. And so a few years ago, I started to look for uh, a successor CEO. Uh, and it, it took a little bit of time, but eventually I found that person. Uh, we, we didn't know it at the time, obviously, but uh, up to the planning, um, uh, some crazy stuff happened, right? So uh, Stan became CEO essentially right as COVID hit. Um, I became executive chairman. Um, I've been helping Shutterstock about half my time uh, now with kind of bigger strategic uh, issues like uh, M&A and uh, uh, kind of where the product map uh, could, could, could go to, just kind of helping wherever I got. Um, so I spent about half my time still on Shutterstock. The other half, I'm down here in Miami, uh, which feels like New York City in 2003. It's an, it's an early tech scene, uh, but I like that. Uh, and I'm starting lots of early stage companies in an early tech scene, which is uh, what I really liked to do back in New York City and, and, and what I'm doing down here in Miami now. So, okay, other than climate and lifestyle, why Miami? What what what? Is it about Miami, Florida that makes you believe that this can be a place, a new Silicon Valley, if you like, or a place where tech companies can move to and incubate? Well, I was looking for a lot of the same components that, uh, that I had back in, back in New York in 2003, which is an early tech scene, um, lots of people that think you're crazy for, for, for starting there, people that tell you there's not enough talent, there's not enough of a network effect, um, I was looking for a very international city. Uh, I was looking for a place where um, my kids that who are very young can uh, grow up and have a little bit of room. Uh, and uh, kind of all of those things came together about a year ago and we started looking for a place in Miami. Uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's a lot of factors. So it wasn't necessarily uh, a draw factor, like that th there were tech startups and there were interesting companies being founded. It was very much you kind of like it was location first, and then you can kind of almost help create the scene when you get there. Yeah, it was. I mean, there were several factors. Um, once COVID hit, um, we we moved uh, into our house, which we spent weekends in uh, at the time. Um, we started to, I started to get used to more room. Couldn't uh, imagine going back to an apartment right now. It's just a different stage of my life. And it's, it's, there's a lot of different things going on here. Uh, I mean, I, we, we considered several places uh, in the United States, but Miami just had all the different components um, of kind of that early tech scene. And, and that's really where I like to, like to be. 
So you say you're, the, you're building world-changing companies in the Miami sunshine. That's kind of the tagline of Pareto Holdings. And in what ways do you want to change the world? Well, we are backing several companies a month uh, right now. So we're making two to three investments a week in early stage companies. Um, we're trying to focus on as many in Miami as we can. Um, it is a small tech scene right now. Uh, it will get bigger. But uh, at that rate, uh, we do look to the whole world to make that level of investment. Um, at the same time, we're incubating a few companies a year uh, in spaces that are big enough uh, where we can really make an impact and places uh, uh, with, with founders that are passionate about those spaces. So we're looking a lot at fintech. We're looking a lot at uh, SaaS software. Um, and we're starting to look a lot at telemedicine, actually. Oh, interesting. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about telemedicine. What kind of the applications and the technologies that you think can really be a paradigm shift in the next five years, 10 years? Yeah, there's, there's a few things that have happened. COVID especially, um, there's been a ton of behavior change. And whenever you have this massive behavior change, you also have uh, displacements and kind of uh, 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 business opportunities, right? So there are big businesses that have gotten used to certain types of behaviors uh, in, 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 this, in this world. And when there's this massive shift, larger companies have, pro have trouble reacting as fast to these kind of changes. So that's where it opens up kind of a, um, all these opportunities for startups to come in that can move very quickly uh, and create um, massive amounts of value really fast um, be, be because of those changes. And one thing that's, that's happened is people have gotten used to visiting doctors uh, from remote. Uh, and, and we're seeing, uh, and we've been brainstorming on lots of opportunities. There are lots of entrepreneurs interested in this area. And there's so, it's so big that you, could, you can essentially um, enter a space like this uh, and compete with, with, with some of the players that have already had success uh, and, and actually get to somewhere really big. Because 20 years from now, um, there, there are some things that change just now that'll, that, that are gonna be, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, key pillars of, of some really huge companies in the future that were started today, I believe. And do you see that in terms of telemedicine, in terms of the healthcare sector? Do you see things like machine learning, AI, kind of remote diagnosis, kind of almost like replacing the, the walk-in health center where you see a doctor, where you see a GP, a practitioner? Do you kind of feel that's where the space is going? Yeah, I mean, there's some things you can't do from your house, uh, but there are some, uh, like, I mean, you can't go to your, you can't do your yearly physical from your house uh, with your doctor from remote. I mean, that's not, I mean, maybe in the future with crazy robots, you can do that. But today that's not possible. And, and we're not, we're, we're, we're definitely not um, crazy moonshot investors. But when you, when you do look at areas like dermatology or mental health, um, these are incredibly big areas uh, of, of, of medicine where suddenly you have patients and you have doctors that we have met and we have interviewed and we have, we have done research on this space that have said they're not going back to the world they uh, were in before. Um, so there, there are some mental health professionals and there are some patients of mental health professionals that say they're never gonna visit their therapist again in person. They just don't need to. In fact, right. it works better uh, from remote and it, um, it's, it's, it's much more convenient and they're much more comfortable from both sides. They're also very efficient. So you don't have this waiting room, you don't have to rent office space, you don't have um, people that are late because of traffic. Um, you can have patients that visit uh, the doctor on, on, on a last minute notice in a, in a totally different way. I mean, th think about mental health. I mean, the last thing a patient wants to do is get in the, you know, schedule an appointment, get in their car. I mean, this is like, you need, you need the technology we have today. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that there were doctors that said that is absolutely not um, feasible, um, who have completely changed their minds now and are doing that, 20, doing that as part of their entire business. So are, are there specialist projects in, in that particular space? You're talking about kind of like maybe the the therapy space, the, the, the psychiatry space, are there specialist tools that are available that are over and above what we're doing now talking on a Zoom? Yeah, there are, but um, honestly, the bar is very low right now. I mean, it looks like this. Yeah. And, and there's not much technology on top of it. So if you just think about that opportunity right there alone, the, it's just massive 
how, how, how much opportunity there is. So uh, we look at uh, um, specific use cases like exactly that and try to think, um, uh, what's the technology we have today? Where's technology gonna be in 10 years? How do we be, build, a, build a billion, $10 billion, $100 billion company um, over the next 10 years that can solve some of these problems? And then we look for entrepreneurs uh, and we seed them and we're patient and it's gonna take some time, but we believe that with multiple irons in the fire and a very talented group of entrepreneurs, we can create some, some massive value over time. Looking at fintech, which is one of the other areas that you mentioned, um, what are the opportunities in America and the States right now for fintech? Because it seems to me that the US is lagging a little bit behind the likes of India and China when it comes to things like contactless pay, payment solutions in mobile phones. Is that what you're looking at or are you looking at slightly more sophisticated enterprise stuff? Um, the, the entire <clears throat> infrastructure, I mean, the, the customer, if you look at the customer experience, customers are constantly looking for less friction and businesses would love less friction. Less friction means they're making, they're making more money and customers are able to get to the, the product or service that they want the quickest. There's still a ton of friction involved. I mean, it's easier than it ever has been. You can use tons of different um, uh, fast payment uh, type solutions. But when you look at even just um, how the infrastructure works, we're still on a multi-day settlement system, which is insane. I mean, this is why people are so excited about cryptocurrency. I mean, I was going to say, it's actually, crazy it's like 2021 and we still have multi-day settlement for, yeah. for, for and, and that's just that's just actually in the same country you're in. Yeah. Imagine, I mean, cross border, border cross border transactions are even 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 harder. I was going to say, cycling back to your Shutterstock days and talking about cryptocurrency, you know, we're now looking at things like NFTs and we're now looking at things like extending copyright on your own content that we upload every single day to Instagram and, and Twitter and stuff like that. Is that something that you're looking at? Is that an extension of what you think potentially the, the Shutterstock promise and offering could be? Yeah, Shutterstock's definitely, um, we're definitely doing work every single day on, on NFTs and, and how, we can, how we can make an impact there. I definitely believe NFTs are, are part of our future. I think, I think smart contracts uh, uh, and blockchain are important. Um, I don't know exactly how cryptocurrencies will work uh, uh, in our future, uh, but they're definitely here to stay. So, yeah. um, you know, I can't tell you what, what a Bitcoin is worth. I have no idea. I don't think anybody does, but I can tell you that uh, in 20 years, there, there'll still be a Bitcoin. Yeah. So just knowing that alone, uh, uh, and, and there are enough people that are so excited about this and trying to innovate on this that anyone who's ignoring it or saying it's, it's some passing fad or some evil creation is, is on the wrong side of the fence. Yeah, I think when you have something that a big enough community, a big enough, big enough network believes in, there's your value, irrespective of what the dollar value of a single Bitcoin is. The space has value because enough people now believe that the space has a value. Um, looking at something like Shutterstock then with NFTs, I imagine that could potentially be a way of rewarding the image generator, the photographer, with almost like a lifetime copyright to any single image that they take. That must be an interesting and inspiring opportunity for the people that create content for, for things like Shutterstock. Yeah, so NFTs are, are interesting uh, at Shutterstock. How how they actually get implement, implemented? We're, we're we're doing a ton of work on that, and we'll we're definitely going to try a lot of things. Like I said today, limited application, but NFTs are going to exist. The smart smart contracts will exist twenty years from now. So the question is how how do you get involved? And you know, it's probably not a five year thing. It's probably not a three year thing. It may be a seven year thing. Uh, but it's it's never too, uh, too too early to start on this stuff, um, and like I said earlier, it's the kind of kernel of an idea of where I usually start. So I'm definitely involved in in, in Shutterstock's NFT uh, discussions, and 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 we're working on that stuff uh, uh, pretty actively right now. After the last year we've had with COVID and the pandemic and lockdowns and and all of the various hardships that we've all faced. What do you think now the world needs if you're going to change it? What are the kind of the, the big ideas, the new ideas that you're sort of looking at and that you think you can harness from Miami? 
Well, like I said, I think telemedicine is, is, is the biggest. Um, behaviors have changed on both sides. I think there's a ton of opportunity. Um, there are specific ailments we've looked at that can be um, innovated on in a telemedicine way. There are technologies that can be innovated on uh, for telemedicine. Uh, and the behavior changes there, which is usually the hardest part. I mean, you can have the best idea in the world. Um, you could be, you know, the result could be massive efficiency and a huge addressable market and tons of revenue. But if you can't get people to actually change the, what they're doing, they're not, they're not going to use your product. Um, but the behavior change is there. It's happened now. Um, and that's, that is the opportunity. Um, I, I think that is probably the biggest opportunity that will come out of, out of COVID um, and, and present itself over the next 20 years with multiple mega businesses. Is there a field or vertical that you're desperate to invest in, but you haven't found the right company, the right idea, the right startup to put your money in? Um, th there's both telemedicine and uh, fintech uh, ideas that, that we, we, we continue to look for, but haven't found just yet. Um, you know, there, there's, there's an interesting dynamic when, when you're investing in a company, when you're investing in a person, when you're investing in an idea, there's three components you're looking at um, at the start. You're looking at the founder, you're looking at um, the idea and you're looking at the timing. And if any one of those is off, you're, you're, it's just not gonna work, right? So the, there's a little bit at the start, a numbers game and you wanna use entrepreneurs that can kind of iterate through multiple ideas uh, in order to get to, to a successful place. So if you can find people that are flexible enough to go uh, to context switch from one idea to another, you, 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 can, you can get um, these amazing entrepreneurs that are also good at that early stage. I mean, when I started Shutterstock, the previous things did not look like Shutterstock at all. There were software companies, one was a gating site, one was a legal kind of um, process automation kind of firm. It, it, these are like, you, in order to be an entrepreneur, you don't know if your idea and the timing of that. So you need to be able to iterate really quick on those two. Those are the real important things when, when we look at investing uh, at the early stage. It's not necessarily, you know, we're not focused on an idea and kind of looking for someone uh, to fill that idea. It's, it's, it's someone that can be flexible enough to move from an idea to an idea on a dime. I mean, literally we, the, our successful entrepreneurs can admit on one day you know, maybe three months after they started with one idea that it's not going to work and flip to another one that's in a completely different space and ramp that up and be completely okay with it. And I was going to say that that takes me on to the next question in a way, because it's like, what is it, do you have a guiding philosophy of, of Pareto in terms of what you invest in? Is it, you know, are you identifying the idea? Are you identifying the entrepreneur? Are you identifying the flexibility and the, and the willingness to learn of the entrepreneur? Kind of what's the evaluation process and criteria like? Yeah, well, a lot of things have to go right for a successful for an entrepreneur to be successful, but it is a little bit of a numbers game from the beginning. So an entrepreneur will not be successful. I mean, the only way an entrepreneur will be successful um, where they're, they're they're not flexible enough to shift from one idea to another really quickly is if their first idea works. And I, you know, I I look. It took me eleven tries. So that means. If I was not flexible enough to move from idea to idea, I had a 10% chance of, of surviving. But if I knew in the beginning, if you told me I had 11 chances uh, and I switch 11 times, I have almost 100, I probably have 100% chance of succeeding. So if you can get an entrepreneur that can context switch really fast and actually take, like go all in, like literally like every single cell of their body into an idea for three weeks and then flip, instantly to an entirely new idea and have them have that same type of energy and passion in that other idea, you have a winning entrepreneur. It's and not, it's also it's the not ability, necessarily the idea. And it's also the ability to let that initial idea go. I mean, I imagine I'm, that must be a hard thing for any entrepreneur that you've built an idea, you've worked it, you've proofed it, you've road tested it, you've, you've pitched it to a million people. And now someone's turning around and kind of going, this isn't going to work. How about this? And it's that ability to let that go that I think must must be part of the, the entrepreneur's psychology and makeup. Exactly. Yeah, that's not easy to do. 
Um, we, so we look for people that can multitask, that can do um, different, totally different types of tasks at once, that can, that can contact switch really quickly. Uh, these, are, these are really important skills for entrepreneurs. Not because it's gonna make them successful in any one single idea, but it'll give them multiple chances to succeed. Because right there, that takes, so you have, the, you, have the, you have the entrepreneur, you have the timing, and you have the idea. It takes timing and idea right out, right out. It gives you multiple shots at time and idea. So it isn't like a single path. You'd kind of advise any entrepreneur starting, starting out on their particular journey is like, you know, be willing to find new paths, be willing to open new doors, be willing to try new things, be willing to experiment wherever that road leads you to have. So one idea really needs to be potentially seven ideas. Yeah. We can't help the entrepreneur act in a different way, but we can help with the ideas and try to match an idea with timing to get that product market fit. We can't change someone's personality though. So that's why the personality is, is so important. So talking about your own investment then, how about your own sort of emotions and how much your, your heart rules your head or, or when you're making a decision that you really believe in and sometimes do you have that same philosophy of I've got to let this go, this just isn't working, we haven't cracked it, we haven't found the scalability or the monetization or the commercial proposition? Do you sort of still go through those same uh, processes yourself? Yeah, I mean, you look, there's only a certain number of hours in the day. And in order to get, uh, in order to get this right, it's the Pareto principle. That's why we called it Pareto Holdings. Uh, you have to spend 80% of your time on the 20% of things that are going to have the most impact. And if you're not doing that, you, you, your time is going to go, it's going to get sunk into, the, idea, into the, the, the tasks that are not the ones that are the most important. So, um, I mean, being an entrepreneur doesn't stop on day one. It's every single day. It's every minute of every single day. So you're constantly asking yourself, are you doing the right things that will have the most impact that day? Uh, that's, these are, these are important um, uh, aspects of, of whether entrepreneurs are successful or not. And today, most of our job at Pareto is trying to find those entrepreneurs that can do this. How successful have you been in, in Miami in finding the right entrepreneurs or are you trying to cast your net as far as you can go? Well, our, we're casting as far as we can go because because we, when we find that um, if an entrepreneur is not in Miami and they come and visit us in Miami, sometimes they move to Miami. So we've we've gotten people to move here, but um, I found one local entrepreneur from Aventura who's starting a company with us, and I believe he has the skill set to do this. Uh, it's hard though. I mean, look, we started a year. We started less than a year ago. Um, so finding one local Miami entrepreneur in the past year with everything that's been going on, I'm pretty happy about that. We have a couple from other locations. We have one that may move here from New York. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't really, that's not my goal is to move as many people to Miami as possible. It's, I do, you know, I am here, so it's nice to have people local and we do want an ecosystem down here and we do want to build the tech scene down here, but we're also building as many businesses as we possibly can. And the more businesses we create, the more jobs we'll create here in Miami, which, which is a great goal as well. Um, I think building, building a city's tech scene is, is really fun. And, and I was gonna say, are you primarily or only solely involved in the tech scene? Or if a good idea comes across your desk that might not necessarily have a strong tech component, are you gonna kinda of go, hey, that could work? Or, or are you basically married to the, we, my skills are in, are in the technology field and that's really where I can be the best judge of an idea? Well, what, I mean, besides real estate, what, well, even real estate, what company's not a tech company anymore? Well, that's true. Uh, a food company, uh, um, um, a, 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 a great new coffee brand. It's still, you're probably dealing with with logistic software and you're probably dealing with uh, e-commerce. Um, you probably can't be a successful new coffee company without uh, having an online presence. I, I think I, everything is, 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 is software today. And if it's not, uh, then you know, how it's about using software to make it more efficient and ready for the next 20 years. I mean, I, I, I truly believe that there's, there's very little uh, business today that's, that's, that's not technology. Or that's at least powered and fulfilled by technology, whether it's reaching your market or reaching your customers or, or, or communications. Yeah. 
Is there an idea or a project that for whatever reason you can't let go of? It hasn't reached fruition, but you're still circling in the back of your mind and you're going, I want that to work. I still believe that could work. I, I mean, I'm not, there's no, there's nothing. I can let ideas go and move on to the next one. Um, I do that all the time. Um, if there is something like that, it's probably because the timing's not right. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out when the idea is right for that timing. Um, we have dozens of ideas on a list. Uh, we go, we go through them all the time. I don't, we, we don't know, uh, all of them and when they're ready for, uh, the right time. So that, that's when we'll hold on to them and, and keep going. It's because we believe there's a future, uh, timing to it. That, that makes better sense. Are you still an entrepreneur yourself in the sense of if an idea that you come up with in the shower one morning makes sense to you, you will invest your own time, your own capital, your own money, your own network to bring it to fruition. That's still on the table for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's still several of our ideas in the works right now. Um, either I or my business partner, Ed, has come up with, uh, sometimes they come to us, the ideas, um, but often we are the, the ones that who came up with the ideas. Okay. Um, do you have a global outlook? I mean, are you looking at ideas wherever they are in the world? And does that involve Zoom calls with, with India or jumping on a plane to go to South America or Europe? Is, you know, are you casting your net literally around the world for, for the next great ideas? Yeah, yeah, we are. And we have, um, we've made several, uh, we have relationships all over the world that we trade deal flow with. Um, often we'll look at an idea that's, that's successful in one geography and think about how, how it, like what's the twist it'll take to get another geography uh, to be up for that uh, same, uh, same task. I mean, often there's, you know, there's difficulties in, in translating one idea from one geography to another, but that also creates opportunity, especially if there's regulatory issues or some sort of cultural or behavioral kind of uh, change. Um, I mean, the hardest ideas are the ones that have, uh, a, you know, a higher barrier to entry. So if you can figure them out, it's going to be, it's going to be harder for others to do the same. So we don't shy away from difficult ideas and, uh, we, we look at the whole planet when we, when we think about them. Anything from this region, we have to ask, we're Arabian business. We're based here in Dubai, which is trying to go through its own you know, evolution into a, a, a mini Silicon Valley of the Middle East. It's got big aspirations for a tech startup scene. Uh, it's attracting a lot of uh, creatives and, and, and entrepreneurs from around, not just the Middle East, but the, the wider Manassa region. Uh, has this been on your radar at all? Have any ideas popped up that you've, you've looked at from here? We haven't, but I'm glad we're, uh, we're talking so that we can get some, uh, some exposure in, in the region and start talking to some local entrepreneurs. Um, and when COVID lifts, I'd love to love to come out there and, and meet with people who are working on all sorts of stuff. There's some good stuff happening here. And you'll probably find a sense of familiarity coming from Miami. The, suit, the two cities are always compared. Big skyscrapers, lots of luxury, lots of beaches. It's, you know, you'll probably feel right at home here. Um, talking about Miami, talk us through the process from a leadership point of view, from a, from a more of a personal point of view of segueing from a CEO, you know, back into kind of more of a startup environment, you know, what's the mindset, mindset shift been like for you from a leadership point of view? It's, um, it was a, it was a refreshing change. I mean, I went from, I went from every day managing a thousand employees to thinking about the early stage, uh, uh, business with zero employees. And also we're trying to talk entrepreneur, talk people into being entrepreneurs. Like there's several people that, you know, along my journey at Shutterstock, I met who I thought should be entrepreneurs. And um, I've gone back and, you know, a lot of them are at different companies now. I mean, over 18 years, they're, they're all over the place, but the ones that are not at Shutterstock that I think could be entrepreneurs, uh, I've reached out to and tried to talk them into starting something. Um, and some of them have done it. Um, and I have a couple that are with us right now uh, working on this stuff. And, uh, and I think it's great. Um, the, the shift is, is what I, I should be dealing with earlier stage businesses. I'm not a career manager. Um, at each stage of Shutterstock, I would kind of hire people that um, would augment my skill set. 
uh, and and help me help me run the business. But uh, the business is set up perfectly now. We found the right CEO, and it's 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 exactly the um, the right structure. Um, it took me a while to find that. I mean, it took me years, but. Uh, but now I'm in the right position. You'd been trying to segue out of that corporate life for a couple of years then before the recent switch. It's been something that kind of been on your mind for a while. Yeah, and it takes time. I mean, I, I probably started three years before I found the person that we put in the role. Oh, wow. Okay. So is it a sense of liberation now you feel a little bit that, that kind of the, you know, the, the, the rucksack, if you like, of a, of a big corporate structure on your back every day has been kind of lifted off you? Yeah, it's not, I mean, I'm working hard every day. It's different. It's a different skill set. It's a different muscle. It's a different, it's a different, um, it's a different thing. Um, and look, everyone's built for a different type, different level of a business if they're, if, if, if they're an executive. Um, I just wasn't going to be the one to take Shutterstock from a thousand employees to 2000 or from 800, from 600 million of revenue to 1.2 billion. Um, uh, we now have the team to do that. And, and uh, the, the great thing about this is I'm still a founder. I'm still the largest shareholder of, of Shutterstock. I'm still actively involved. Um, and I can say, you know, Hey, is this helpful? I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z. If they say no, awesome. I'll spend my time on something else. If they say yes, great. I have, um, something to offer. It turns out there's some stuff I can do and I'm continuing to help out, especially when it comes to the M&A uh, type uh, pieces of the business and also um, some of the earlier kind of um, some of our network effects and how to, how to evolve them. So how our contributor base works and how to take that to the next level, how we think about um, the workflow of the buyer, um, some of the uh, M&A uh, pieces and how the product and workflow kind of integrate. I'm involved in, in all of those pieces still. How can the technology of Shutterstock actually um, improve as we, um, you know, we look at how sophisticated the internet is with AI and with machine learning and with um, our understanding of collection and use of data. Um, where do you think the evolution of Shutterstock can go empowered by that new technology that wasn't around when you started? Yeah, I mean, Shutterstock has turned out to be, um, I mean, we started with just a simple image subscription product. And today, um, today it's, you know, it's, it's, it's images, it's footage, it's, it's 3D assets for AR and VR, it's music. Um, uh, and it's, it's also workflow. So, you know, we, we sell, you know, several images per second and we have people that spend so much time on our site, uh, millions of people that spend so much time on our site that, you know, increasing the amount of time that they spend on our site uh, is, um, you know, even if you do that a little bit across these big swaths of people, you you start to get, um, you start to improve their their, their business um, uh, uh, day, uh, and you also you start to uh, create a more valuable customer experience. And so, I think Shutterstock's moving in, in in a great direction right now, where we've moved into we have an amazing enterprise product as well as our e-commerce product. We have an editorial product um, that's that's doing some amazing things, and our customers are are um, uh, 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 love, uh, and and it's kind of new, and, and we're thinking about different technologies uh, uh, and product features that can help our customers across um, all of these different pieces of the business. Um, it's really exciting. I think Shutterstock is is supposed to be in the future a, a, a very successful, uh, bigger company than it is today. Uh, this is probably a slightly unfair question, um, and maybe it's not even applicable, but is there a, a business or an entrepreneur that you're particularly proud of supporting or particularly proud of identifying and helping? Um, well, all of our entrepreneurs, I mean, everyone in our, in, in the Pareto network uh, uh, is amazing. Uh, and we have, um, I mean, there's, there's one right now, it's a FinTech startup. Um, uh, he started at Shutterstock. He, he was at Shutterstock a long time ago. He moved to a couple of companies in between, and he's done he's done some amazing things. We're on the, we're on the second idea with him. Um, it's gotten some traction. Uh, we've raised a successful round from the outside, actually, also, um, and he's doing some amazing things uh, as as a CEO and an entrepreneur. Um, going back to the 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 personal and the the segue from one role to another. 
and how you construct your day. Are you someone that embraces routine or now actually enjoys the fact that routine is probably less part of your day than it might have been as CEO? There's not having routine helps me. I, I, um, I, I need lots of free space during the day and I also context switch constantly. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, I, 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 open space on my calendar is great. Um, uh, I think I, I can think bigger. I wind up uh, doing uh, things during that space that, I mean, the worst type of day I can possibly have is one where I have back-to-back -back Zoom calls. And uh, I see some more coffee here. So further caffeinate, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the Zoom call, Zoom fatigue, we, we all feel it. It's horrible. I mean, back to back Zoom calls, you, what, I mean, you, you're just, you can get nothing done. Um, and it's just, it's not very productive. I think, you know, the, the worst thing you know, in a pre COVID world, the worst thing you could do is have the kind of this meeting culture where you're back to back in meetings and uh, there were too many people in meetings. Um, I mean, look, these tools have done a very good job of getting people addicted to uh, now doing that in a virtual kind of video environment. And I think we need to resist that as well. A phone call still works. You know what I look like. You don't need to. You don't need to Zoom call me. Just, just pick up the phone. That works just as well. And it usually lasts about half an hour less than a Zoom call as well. Um, so you don't sort of have a structured day then. Are you, you know, you, you're not someone that kind of goes, well, I've got to get up at seven thirty, breakfast, take the kids to school, and then that, and then it's calls, and then it's meetings. You know, if you feel that that's happening, are you someone that has to fracture it to give yourself different headspace and different environment? I mean, it happens organically. Sometimes, I mean, I can feel the frustration sometimes if I have too many back-to-backs and I break it up. Um, I mean, look, if I took every meeting possible, I would never have any time to, to, to think big. Uh, and so it's also about being just uh, maniacal uh, uh, about your time and, uh, sometimes you need to turn meetings down because it, it's just there's only so many hours in a day. Sometimes someone's setting up a meeting to try to solve something with you. Sometimes when you resist that meeting ever get, getting created, somehow the problem gets solved. Do, do you have an off button as an entrepreneur? Like, do you have to go, right, it's six o'clock off. It's kids, family, relaxation, that's it, I'm done. It, can you exist like that? Or is it always like, right, I'll have the off button at six, but the laptop's gonna be back on at nine, nine thirty because I've had a great idea or I need to send that email. It, it's, on, it's, it's on and off. I mean, it depends, on, it depends on what's going on. It depends on how much scale I have in my life at that moment, how many, you know, if, if I've passed ideas on to entrepreneurs, it's great, they're, they're kind of in motion. If they're in my head and I'm looking for a person to solve that problem, um, often I'm doing it myself. Uh, and so it comes in fits and starts, but um, I do find time for my family and my kids and everything else in life. And uh, it, it does seem to work out. How did COVID impact your work-life balance or your attitude to work-life balance? Did, it find, did you find that it actually changed much about your working day? Uh, or was it kind of roughly the same, but just you spending more time indoors? You know, did it did it change how you approach work life balance in a way? It it didn't change work life balance, but it did change the type of like I mentioned earlier, the type of ideas I'm looking at because because I was keenly aware of the the behavior change around us and and how that could how that could affect business. Um, I mean, again. Like the biggest opportunities come from the biggest displacements in behavior. Do you, do you, do you talk to your uh, entrepreneurs from a mentorship point of view about the, the importance of a work-life balance, about, guys, don't spend 23 hours a day on this thing. You've got to get some sleep. You've got to change your uh, environment. You know, you're not going to be productive if you're just kind of burning the midnight oil for like five months straight. Or do you understand that that passion will fuel better ideas or better solutions? Yeah, yeah, I, I tried to, but at the same time, there's also like, I mean, you can be idealistic or you can be realistic. When I started Shutterstock, I was thinking about it every single minute of the day. I still think about Shutterstock every single minute of the day. It's been tw almost 20 years. There are some things that, I mean, the, the, the type of personality 
the type of um, behaviors it takes to, to start a business and be successful, those aren't easily removed from, 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 from your brain, right? And so, I mean, we have entrepreneurs that have good life balance, good work-life balances. We also have some that don't. I, I also know there's no way I can talk some of them into, you know, adding a few more hours of sleep uh, into their, their schedule or taking a break. Um, I mean, I didn't take a vacation for the first, you know, six years when I started Shutterstock. It's not... I, I, I work literally every single day on that thing for years. Um, it's people are built in different ways and people can handle different things. I mean, there are times I'll go three months without, you know, with working every single day and then there'll be a month I take off and it's just people working different. I, I, I don't feel like I should be the one to, um, you know, dictate to my entrepreneurs how they should, how they should work. That being said, if there's something wrong, I'll get involved. If I can tell, you know, they're, they're being affected in some negative way, I'll get involved, but people have a capability to kind of balance their own lives. And sometimes um, that means working nonstop for three months. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily unhealthy, especially as an, it's part of being an entrepreneur. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's not. Um, and sometimes you'll do it and then uh, take a couple week break and go back to it. And people work in all sorts of different ways. And that's the passion. I mean, the, the thing about being an entrepreneur is this isn't, driven by the desire to build a 20 billion dollar company it's driven by the the idea that what you've got in front of you can be a genuinely successful business that you need the world to see and you you know so it's you're not really driven by the end result in 10 years you're driven by the end result in 10 weeks or 10 minutes so the the, the desire to work and work and work and get it out into the world that's going to be very hard to switch off right yeah i mean sometimes it's both we have we have entrepreneurs that are interested in the big financial outcome and the idea. Um, we have entrepreneurs that are more on the idea side. We have entrepreneurs that are more on the money side. It's, again, it, it runs the gamut. There's no perfect answer to this stuff. People are motivated by all sorts of stuff. And it doesn't matter to you what they're motivated by. You don't really mind. It's not like, oh, you're motivated too much by money or you're an idealist. It's whatever, whatever gets them out of bed to work on their idea, that's, that's, uh, that's appealing to you. Yeah. What, look, success looks like a lot. I mean, success comes in lots of different forms. Uh, people work in lots of different ways and people are motivated by lots of different things. Um, but if there's enough passion to create the uh, to create the successful company to get the outcome they're looking for, then, then, then it works. Who were your mentors when you first started out? I, I didn't really have any. I mean, I, I had, you know, famous profile mentors like, you know, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates of the world, which, um, you know, I, I would follow every single move they made um, as a kid, but I didn't, I didn't really have any business mentors. There were no, I just, I iterated, I started stuff, I learned um, I just did it. So who was kind of nudging you in the right direction? Was it just a kind of a self-referential thing the whole time? Like, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else. A kind of a trial and error approach. There wasn't someone, there wasn't a knock, someone whose door you'd knock on and go kind of, I can't figure this thing out. I mean, there were people along the way that um, I asked questions. Look, there were, there were times where, yeah, I mean, I, I would hire people that knew things I didn't know. I would, I would ask questions, um, but I learned, I just learned on my own. I mean, that, that's, I've never worked in another business. You, you've never had a manager or a boss who you thought, wow, I need to emulate that or I need to very definitely not emulate that. I mean, I had a couple of short job stints, you know, in, in high school, uh, but the second I got to college, I was, I was iterating on different ideas. That, I mean, the trial and error, especially when the risk is the lowest, when you're the youngest, when you're like, when you're the youngest, I mean, when you're in college, if you can iterate as much as possible at that time, there's no risk. What were your parents like then? Were they someone that kind of understood that you had this kind of entrepreneurial zeal and spark and encouraged you? Or were they a little bit more like, John, come on, get a steady profession? Or They were a little more conservative. They were not, they didn't understand. I don't think they completely understood what I was doing. Um, which is okay. I mean, I, I think, I think I realized at the time, you know, when you look at kind of, I, I looked at patterns, I looked at, you know, the top hundred software, you know, people I could find and kind of what they did. Uh, and, and it wasn't conventional stuff. So, you know, the fact that I wasn't being conventional seemed, um, 
on pattern to me at the time. So when did they kind of go, were I, okay, John, you were right. Well, they were just, I mean, it was probably somewhere. <laughs> The first just after the yeah. just after the stock market flotation in 2012, they suddenly realized that yeah, yeah, my boy was on to something. It was probably a little bit before that, but the, <laughs> uh, the yeah, as I was failing the startups, they were probably wondering what is this kid doing, you know, with all those startups that are failing. It's interesting. I was actually thinking about this the other day. It's almost like the um, the tech startup and the entrepreneurial lifestyle and the desire to kind of get under the hood and start coding that. Is almost like the kid picking up the rock, picking up the guitar in the 1970s and going, "I'm going to be in a band." It, that, it's the new rock stars, aren't aren't they now? Tech entrepreneurs, because it's shunning everything conventional around them, shunning the regular career path, and diving into something just because you believe that this is kind of what you're meant to do. Totally. I mean, it's it's a tool. A computer is a tool, just like a guitar. And you know, the, the younger you you learn how to master it, the better. Are your kids coding already, or are they the right age? Well, my my oldest kid is two years old, so. Oh, okay. This might not apply then. This next question, because it seems that like you've you've kind of plowed very much your own furrow. But is there a piece of advice you received maybe when you were in your twenties that seemed to you at the time flat out wrong, but now you look at it in a slightly more positive light and kind of go, ah, oh, I know where they're coming from. Okay, so. So one thing at Shutterstock that I, I did not do, so um, I pushed away, so Shutterstock was profitable from the beginning, but um, people today start businesses that um, it's kind of, to me, it was backwards to start in an unprofitable way, raise large rounds of money and push forward in kind of this scorched earth type of way. And I never really understood that, that method. Um, I started Shutterstock, it was profitable from day one. I ran at a 20%, actually almost 40% EBITDA margin in the beginning in 2003 for many years. Um, and people were, you know, VC firms would kind of reach out and say, I want to invest. Um, and I think you should also, you know, have a negative EBITDA margin. I'd be like, what the hell is wrong with you? That's not a business. Like, you don't, you don't lose money in a bit. Like, what are you talking about? And so, it, I, Shutterstock's a really unique technology company in that it's always been profitable. It's not that it's, it's, it hasn't been run in a way where um, it was growth at all costs. Um, I mean, that was 2003 also, interest rates were a little higher, VC wasn't as easy to get, it was a little more expensive uh, to get VC at the time. Um, today, money is, is flowing like crazy. Um, so I would say I flipped a little bit on that. Uh, today, if you're starting a company and it's, it's, it fits into a certain type of uh, growth at all costs mentality. I do think it's, it's worthwhile because there are investors out there that are basically saying, uh, I'm investing in a lot of these. I know a lot of them are going to go to zero. Um, go for it. So when you look at something like an Uber, for instance, which is kind of like racking up the losses, but it's building a network that could just have exponential value in four or five years time, you actually look at that and kind of go, well, that actually makes sense to me now in a way it wouldn't when you started out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, I mean, there are certain businesses that after, you know, that, that amount of time um, should start to scale and, you know, expand their EBITDA margins. But I, I don't really know much about um, that business in particular. But, you know, from the start, I think uh, that kind of losing money mentality, I mean, I, look, I, I was not that kind of entrepreneur because I, I was like, I'm not going to be beholden to, you know, my next round. But I see it today in that it's almost impossible not to do because if you have a competitor that's doing that, it's very hard for you to grow. So, I mean, in, in, you know, in... In, in that kind of case, there, there are several competitors in that mobility space. Um, they're competing for the same thing. And look, if you are the one that, that has the biggest network effect um, and you can always kind of pull that lever where you can expand your margins, then sure, it probably makes sense to do that a bit longer. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess back to your original question, um, that's probably the one thing that has changed. I mean, in the beginning, I was always looking for I would always encourage entrepreneurs to have that EBITDA margin from the beginning and kind of 
grow at a steady pace and you know keep some on the side and use that cash to make acquisitions and don't depend on your next equity or debt round. But today it's a little different. Uh, and while it may not be my favorite business model to, to kind of always depend on your next round, it's, it may be necessary because of, of, of the competitive environment, depending on the business. So when that comes to your own investments then, do you have a, a particular guiding philosophy in terms of how long are you going to support, when you exit, at what point you think about exiting, at what scale is this new venture at before you think about, right, you need to go on your own? Yeah, I mean, the great thing about what we, what we have is we haven't raised outside money, so we're only using our internal uh, cash. Uh, so there isn't really anyone to tell us what to do. Uh, and we definitely do the first seed round. We do that pre-seed round. We've often done the seed, and, um, and now that we look at the A rounds, we may do some of those also. So it's not, I mean, it's a different type of incubation model in that we're not raising an outside fund. That keeps the decision-making kind of lean and kind of tight. And are you all the founding partners of uh, Pareto? You're all kind of roughly on the same page. You're all pretty much aligned in terms of the kind of things you want to look at, invest in. and Yeah, definitely. Sort of as we begin to wrap this up, um, I want to ask you, and I think I probably know the answer to the question, um, um, having talked to you for the last 40, 40 or so minutes. Is there a piece of technology or innovation, do you think, that's going to have the most profound impact on the way we live in the next 10 years? That's a great question. Um, I, I do think there, there's two. Um, I, I, I do think that um, the blockchain and, 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 and uh, decentralized finance is something. I don't know exactly how it's going to, to implement itself, but I know it's going to be a big part of our future. That's one. Um, the second is uh, AR and VR. And um, I, I, think, uh, I think there'll be augmented reality applications that are, that are pretty amazing uh, that'll come up in our future. Um, so those are, those are two spaces I, I keep very, very close to right now. Yeah, because I think that cryptocurrency particularly, I think we're looking at it as uh, like we look at stocks and shares and, and we, you know, we buy it at X and we watch it go up and none of us potentially understand why it's gone up. We're just happy it's gone up because we've made a few dollars. Do you actually think that we found its ultimate use case yet, cryptocurrency? We, we haven't found its use case. Uh, it, it may be, I mean, I think the smart contract is, is incredibly um, uh, interesting, uh, and, and there will be several use cases. I think this NFT thing is pretty interesting as well, um, and it'll push more use cases like it uh, because there's there's been actual real transactions of it right now. Even if people right, and, fi and, the, and the final question, the one you get asked probably more than any other question, but I have to ask it. Is there a single piece of advice to any entrepreneur watching, someone that's at the beginning of an idea, somebody that believes that they've got something within their grasp that they can, they can take to the market soon. Is there a single piece of advice you can give them from your 20 plus years experience? Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's do every job before you hand it off, right? So in this, kind, and in this kind of fundraising environment, that's difficult because people are raising so much money and moving so fast. But at the beginning of Shutterstock, I was the first customer service rep, I was the first engineer, I was the first uh, web designer. I was the first um, uh, customer experience, like UX person. Um, I wasn't good at any single one of these jobs, but I did them. And I think that's important. I answered customer phone calls and they called. Um, and, and, and that's super, I, I mean, even, even up until, you know, my last, even through my last years as, as CEO, these past few years, I would listen in on customer service calls. And it's some of the same stuff uh, that people were asking from the beginning days. And uh, that was verification that those were super important moments for me in the beginning to really understand what the customer needed, um, what the customer was looking for, um, why the customer was there and what they needed next. And uh, I would just say like, you know, you're gonna wake up one day and need a marketing person. I hope you did the marketing first, like spend the first few thousand dollars yourself. Uh, play every position on the field, essentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're good at it or not. It's just that that experience is going to be immenseful and and last years. It's 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 going to be really impactful and last for years. Wonderful. John, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I'm really sure that all the people watching in are going to get an awful lot of inspiration and insight from you. So many thanks indeed for joining us today, John, and best of luck. And we look forward to catching up with your uh, all of your new ideas and all of your new ventures in the years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be here. And thank you all for watching. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eddie Taylor, and you've been watching AB Talks.